All right, welcome to my Rotax Max assembly video. Today we're going to try and save a Rotax engine that uh, failed on me about a month ago. See if we can get it to live again. Now, on this end uh, of the rod, you can see it's pretty mangled. And basically what happened is the bearing on the bottom end, which looks like the top end but bigger, decided to disintegrate into many, many, many pieces. The engine locked up, seized and bent the rod while it uh, did so. So we inspected the engine, the piston's obviously taken quite a bit of damage. And there's some scoring there and you think, oh dear, lots of metal got around there. But inspecting the actual cylinder bore, we are pretty decent. Uh, nothing you can feel, no real marks. So throughout the process we're going to refer to the Rotax repair manual which is available on the Rotax website. Uh, this will give you all the specification information you need, the service intervals of the engine tells you when everything needs to be done, all the assembly and disassembly instructions. I've printed a copy here so I can scribble all over it and get it covered in oil rather than having my laptop over here. But it gives you how everything goes together, all the specifications, gives you all the uh, special tools you can have. So here's the special tools and stuff related to balancing the crank properly and pressing it in and out properly, which can be difficult to do on your own. So we've got ourselves a new rod assembly, new piston, new gaskets and so on, new bolts, and we're going to try and reassemble the engine and make it live again. So before you take your engine and decide to build it yourself, there's a couple of things you need to be aware of. Certainly in the UK and Europe, if you're racing a Rotax class, you have to have a sealed engine, which means the engine's put together by a Rotax approved service center. The engine has then got a tag that is put through the crankcase, the cylinder, and the head, and maybe the, va the reed valve and so on. And this tag is then made in a way that if you wish to open the engine, you have to break it. And once you break it, you can't replace it very easily without getting a new one. That stops the engine being tampered with and people cheating by doing things the engine's not supposed to do. So be aware that if you are to break a seal on an engine, you are likely to be looking at quite a bit of cost to ever get it resealed. So I don't recommend resealing an engine that's new. If you're buying a new engine, I would recommend it is bought from the Rotax Service Centre and that the Rotax Service Centre builds it to spec and seals it for you for racing purposes. However, if you are just out to have some fun with your mates or if you are just going to have a second engine for practice to keep your race engine fresh, then a good old engine can do quite well. The dynagraph below is the current engine you see here before it blew up and compared with a brand new Rotax Evo engine out the box. And you can see here the blue line is this 20, 20 year old engine. It makes almost exactly the same power, extra 0.1 at peak, but critically it made two or three horsepower more top end when you're at the end of the rev range, which matters on long straights compared to a brand new Rotax. So an old engine built to spec can still be good. Now this is no by all means the best result you can get out of a new engine. This engine out of the box is pretty poor for a new engine, but it does show that even buying a Rotax engine new, they aren't always good. Uh, my friend's one was similar. I think he made 29.3, where these are 29.4 and 29.5. Uh, after a rebuild and a reseal, and get a thing to spec, he managed to get a peak of about 30.3, I believe. And it was similar power to here. And it just had a bit of extra arc over here, more peak, and then carried the line stronger here, and then made power more similar to my old engine here, which is the blue line, than the Rotax one that was new in the red. And he definitely noticed a good power band difference, and that uh, our local track he picked up two or three mile an hour at the end of the straight. So it's definitely worth getting your engine built to spec. Now, the cost of this is like three, four hundred pounds for a small end, for a top end rebuild, should I say. And if you're doing a full bottom end rebuild and reseal, you could be looking at six, seven hundred pounds. So it's definitely not worth getting an old engine and putting that much engine that money into it. You buy, you buy a second hand one of these for three, four, five, six hundred pounds. You then put six hundred pounds into it, getting it fished. You're almost at the point of buying a brand new engine from a from a service centre who will normally strip them down brand new and rebuild them and seal them before they sell them to you, so you know they're good. This engine in red here was out of the box from Rotax, not from a service center. So you it's pot luck as to how good your engine is. If, however, you've got an engine like this, or you're only ever gonna practice, you can pick up these engines relatively cheap. And if you've got the tools and the skills to actually rebuild your engine, you can save yourself a lot of money when it comes to servicing and maintaining your practice engine or an engine that just you just drive for fun only. 
um, there's good savings here. So the piston and gasket set for a top end might only cost you £130. You're saving yourself potentially £200 on a top end rebuild each time. The bottom end is a bit more complex, but again, you can buy parts cheap. And in this case, what I did was I had the service centre local to me fit the rod. And the reason is, is that it's a special tool to press the pin out and then press it back in. But when you have the rod fitted, these two sides of the crankshaft may be misaligned. And if they're not aligned, they're not moving along the same centre, you can get some vibrations or potentially if it's so off, the engine won't turn or it'll just lock up. So I had them balance the crank, which requires a special tool where they put the crankshaft on, they fit the rod, and then they have two needle gauges running on it to prove that it's got no movement either side. And then if it has done it, they'll basically persuade it into the right alignment. And once it's aligned, you know you're good. They charged me £40 in labour to do that. So you can get your new rod, take it to your service centre, or potentially any two-stroke building place that has a crankshaft alignment uh, kit, get them to align it for you, and then you're good to assemble the engine yourself. So our first step is to repair our crankcase. We need to remove all of the sealing gasket here, make sure these surfaces are clean. Uh, we're also going to hot wash and clean off the insides to make sure there's no debris and any gunk in there. Uh, and then we're going to change some seals that are inside the engine. So we've got a couple of crankshaft seals here and here. And in the water pump, there'll be a couple of seals there worth changing because it all comes as part of the kit. Just change it, make sure it's all brand new and good. So to clean the surfaces, you can use a Stanley blade and a scraper. Being very careful, this is aluminium, it will score. And you can just scrape away at all the uh, old gasket and make sure the surface is nice and clean and then give it a good wash over. So the next step is to replace the seals. And you'll see a number of seals in the crankcase here. We've got one there. Uh, there are a pair in the water pump area. And there is one on the other side of the crankcase. And they are supplied in the new kit here. The way to remove them is either using the specialist uh, tools supplied by Rotax, which you probably not want to have. So the other way is to get a screwdriver and a rubber mallet and just lightly press the seal out and to push it out. So the new crank seals, you need to be aware that while they look the same size on the outside, they are different on the inside diameters. You can check using your old seal as to which size matches which, or you measure the uh, sides of the crankshaft, you can see which side matches for each side of the crankcase. Now to put these in without damaging them, what we can do is you can place the seal where it needs to be, take your old seal and put it on top, then using a socket the same size as the uh, seal, you can then press it in and then you tap it down with a rubber mallet to make sure it's in nice and flush and level. You can also then move it to side to side if you need to offset to help level it off. But one thing you need to be careful of is a little spring that runs around the inside of here and that spring must not come out. So be sure that that spring is seated inside your seal and it doesn't come out. If it comes out, it's not going to work properly. So the seal's in. The next ones is the water pump seals. There's actually two of them here back to back. So you use a screwdriver again to fish them out and then similar technique, you can use the old seal to help push them in. And the two seals go face to face like this and then put in the hole down there as so. And the next, your water pump just slides in like so. And then it's retained by a pin once we get to the gearbox. So before we install the crankshaft, we want to just check these bearings are good. You've got two bearings for your crankshaft, you've also got two bearings for your balance shaft. And what we're just going to do is we're going to give them a little spin round, make sure they're relatively quiet, make sure there's no real play in them, any sounds, they got in and out movement, side to side movement, any grinding sounds. They seem pretty good, so we're going to leave them alone. It's very rare to get an issue with a bearing like this on an engine, but you never know. Um, and if you have to change them, you can get them pressed out, replace the bearing and put them pressed in. They're not that expensive to change if you need to. If we're happy with the bearings, we're just going to give them a tiny, tiny little drop of two-stroke oil just to pre-lube them to make sure they've got a bit of lubrication in there for when we start the engine the first time. Just pour a little bit of oil, and that's probably a bit too much because I'm doing it one-handed. And just spin the bearing by hand, just get the work of the oil in there, rub it round just to make sure the bearings are pre-lubed. So to install the crankshaft, we need to place our sealing gasket for the crankcase on the gearbox side, and the gearbox side is the side with the water pump. 
we lay that down like that. We also need to insert our balance shaft and insert our crankshaft. Now our crankshaft has a spline for the gearbox side and a tapered edge for the clutch side. So the gearbox side needs to go down here. There's also a seal here you can change as well. So our balance shaft, the spline edge needs to go downwards. You can only get one way around because only one side will fit through that bearing and only one side will fit in that bearing. So once you get your balance shaft in place, you need to lower your crankshaft in. Uh, it helps if you raise the casing off the ground. And we just lower that in like so. We then get the other half of the crank casing, lower it over the top and align it and then gently tap it down. Once it's all aligned on these dowels, we can then put the bolts in to screw it down. So with the crank case on, be aware there's a couple of different length bolts. Uh, some of the raised higher bolts are longer and some of the other bolts are slightly shorter. There's quite a few bolts on this case and there's here, 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 all around here. There's some up here, some in here. It's very difficult to get them all right first time. It's easy lead to uh, miss one by mistake. A nice firm, even spread. And then go over them again to make sure they're all even. This is the crankcase clip clamps down. Some bolts may loosen up again, so just go over more than once. Make sure they're all evenly tightened. Next step is to cut down this gasket. It's got this connecting piece here to stop it from falling apart in the packaging or while you're handling it. But you just need to get your knife along here, gently cut through it and make sure it's all uh, flush with the surface of the block. So now we've got the bottom end together. Just give it a hand turn, make sure it moves freely. Uh, there should be some side to side movement in the rod. There should also be some side to side movement in the crankshaft. Make sure that's in spec, refer to your manual. You've got a tiny little gasket there to be careful of. Uh, we need to clean this up. And what we'll do now is also we'll pre lube the big end bearing. Now we're going to move on to the gearbox assembly. So you're going to have two main gears, some reduction gears, and the water pump gear, a little pin for the water pump, and two circlips. Now, get new circlips, they're like a pound extra. It's better than having broken circlips on there that are going to fail. The main gears have two types. There's the metal gears you can see here. These are non-genuine parts, a lot cheaper than the Rotax parts, but again, just as good. If you're going to race the engine, they have to be Rotax parts, but you're probably going to get sealed by a dealer anyway. If you're building your own, you can use Rotax gears, or you can use non-genuine ones, or you might have plastic gears. If you've got plastic gears, you must use the old style shoe clutch. Um, the new clutch must not be used with these gear, without these gears. So if you're going to put the new style clutch on, which is a heck of a lot better for being reliable, you need to upgrade the gears as well. These gears only go on one way. If you put them on the wrong way, things won't mesh properly. They also have alignment marks on the gear and on the splines to make sure things are aligned. And then finally, they have marks to mesh them together as well. So to install the first gear, you will see a dot on here and a small line on here to make sure they're aligned. Same again on the crank, you'll see a dot and an align. However, these aren't meshed together. They need to be rotated to the right point to mesh together. So if we rotate the engine round, we should find a single dot over here. We bring the single dot this way, and then we'll find a double dot on this side. See if we'll spot it, there it is. We mesh the gears so the small dot and the double dot go together. If these gears are the wrong way up, it won't mesh level. You can see they're meshed quite level together, and it's all good. Next, we install the pin for our water pump. It's a tiny little pin, which has to easily dropped. Has to go through the side of the pump, which is really hard to do when you're holding it one-handed. Like so, get it in the middle. And then the water pump gear itself goes on over it with a little groove and holds it in place. There is also a washer that has to go on here. This gear goes on to here. Let's make sure it's uh, aligned. There we go. And then the reduction gear goes between the two on this pole here. Give it a little bit of wiggle and it should pop in like that. That's the gear assembly. So as you turn the engine, the water pump turns and the balance gear turns. So finally, we need to store our circlips on our main gears. One goes here, already done. 
second one needs to go on here. So using your circlet pliers, you just need to align that up. These probably aren't the best pliers for this particular circlet, but it's what I've got to hand. And put it on like that. Make sure it's fully seated in the groove and make sure it's closed up as far as it can be. So when it comes to the gearbox housing cover, we've got uh, two special bolts at the bottom, which actually have cutouts. Now this is your oil drain and this is your oil overflow. So when you put bolts on these, these have special washers on them to make sure they seal. So when it sits over that way, that's your oil drain. And I forgot now, that's your level. And so you pull this one out so when you're filling the gearbox, make sure you don't overfill it. And that wants to take the oil out of it. There's also a gasket we need to put over. Over that like that. Line the housing cup and then put your bolts in all round. And we're going to put your washers on these two here. Just using the minimum amount of trigger on my gun to get the bolts in and then just go over them with the ratchet and make sure they're all just nicely, firmly, evenly taut. Just go around it twice just to be sure everything that one there is a bit more. Make sure everything's evenly tight. That one there, see, needs a bit of extra work. And go over it again. So next we need to fit our piston and our barrel. So what we need to do is to measure our piston with our micrometer, work out the exact diameter of the piston. So this is supposed to be a 53.95 and there's a whole range of piston sizes available to go with your barrels. Now you're supposed to use a bore gauge to measure your barrel. This is already measured at exactly 54.00 and it's also stamped here with an A, A, B or B, depending what size range this barrel engine was. However, given that it's 20 years old, it could well have worn larger. But this particular one was an A, which is a 54.0. It still measures a 54.0. We've used a bore gauge to do that. If you check my full-blown car engine building series, I've got a whole episode about doing bore gauge stuff there. So we've measured this. We've ordered the correct piston diameter which is in this case 53.95. We've gone for a wall clearance of 0.05 millimeters. You can, in theory, go as low as 0.04 and still be in spec, but on another page of the manual, it says 0.06. So I've gone down the middle at 0.05 every time. That seems to work well. It's what the engine builder agreed is probably about the right range to be in. So I'm sticking to that. If you go tighter, you risk an engine that could seize. If you go looser, you're losing power. Now, the wall clearance tolerance is a maximum of 0.08 and if your wall clearance has gone beyond that, i.e. your bore is worn bigger or your piston has shrunk over time as you've been using your engine, then you're going to lose some power. That's about the time you want to do a top end replacement. Piston direction, you've got a ring gap and a little tiny blow, blow hole there in the piston. You want the piston so the arrow points towards the exhaust side of the engine. You want to bring the ring around the front and align the ring with that little hole. The piston then goes on this way. So the front of the engine is this side, where the start motor is, and the crank sensor is the back of the engine where the exhaust goes. That's the direction the piston needs to go on, and that's where the ring needs to align now. So to install our piston, what we're going to do is we're going to put one of the circlips in first on one side. We will then put the piston over and slide the pin through. Once the pin's through, we'll put the other circlip in. There's also the top end needle bearing. This needs to go into the rod, like so. And then obviously the piston the pin will go through. So the easy way to get the first circlip in is to put the pin in, line it just behind where the circlip goes, put one side in hook in, and then using a small pick or small screwdriver, using this hole here, with your finger over it to lever it in. This might not go first time with the camera in the way, but we'll give it a go. And if not, I will do it off camera. So get it in there and lever it on. So we've got our first circlip in. We're just going to get a bit of two stroke oil out of here. And we're just going to 
free lube up. Get your finger in the little end bearing. Rub some oil in there. Nice and generous with it. Then get our pin. Put the end of that in a bit of oil. Smear it all around nicely just to make sure everything's pre lubed when it goes together. So now we've got a little bit of oil on it. Piston, make sure it's facing the right direction. Make sure the side clip side is on the side you're not trying to put the pin in. Get the pin, get it to start going through. And then your tricky bit is to get everything to stay in the place and line up. Get it to go through the needle bearing. Can be a little bit tough. The torrents in this thing are extremely fine, so getting to line up and go through can be a bit tricky. But once it goes through, you will have a needle bearing rod pin and a single circlip installed. And then you just need to install the remaining circlip on the outside. So now our piston is fully installed. What we're going to do is install the base gasket and then the actual barrel. Now, Rotax give you four different base gaskets to change the squish because every engine is slightly different and your squish needs to be set in a certain range depending on the regulations of your championship. So some engines run a squish of 1.2 millimeters, some run a 0.95, some run one, one millimeter, it all depends. But what you're going to do is get your thinnest gasket first, install your thinnest gasket making sure you've got the waterway the right way around, install it over the studs like so, and install your barrel on top. You're then going to torque everything down as per normal. You do your, you measure your squish, and then if you're too thin or too loose, you will then remove the barrel again and do this part again. So before we install it the first time, we're going to loop up our piston and loop up our cylinder wall just to make sure we've got a nice bit of oil on there so things don't rub and contact while we're installing. Try not to get any oil on the top of the piston doesn't need to be there it needs to be around the sides and then same again with the barrel you just want to put some oil around the inside so to install it hold our piston up squeeze our ring so it's nice and tight get the barrel lined up as well just gently fettle it until it moves falls into place and then align yourself on your studs and then push your barrel down and so now your piston is installed like so. Now we need to, to bolt down the barrel, which is four nuts here, and then put the cylinder head cap on as well, and then measure our squish. Next we install our cylinder head gasket, which is this little rubber o-ring here, and our cylinder head sits on top like so. And then we have five bolts to install to hold it down, clamp it down. We're going to torque it down and then we'll do our squish test. So the way we measure squish is we use solder. Now if you're going for a target around the one millimeter mark for a casino engine, you use two millimeter solder. If you're going to do like a junior engine at 1.2, then you use three millimeter solder. You take the solder, you insert it down the spark plug hole and you push it right to the edge of the piston and what you do is you turn the engine over and you will feel at some point some resistance as it squishes. And you go around a couple of times until you stop feeling resistance. And you pull your solder out. And the next step you do, you take your verniers and you will measure how much that is crushed down to. So if you wanted one millimeter and this is crushed down to 1.1, You'd put a thinner gasket in. If you've measured 0.9, you'd put a thicker gasket in. And you just repeat the last process where you change the base gasket until your uh, squishes as you desire. Now, if you're unable to reach the desired squish with any gasket on the market, on an unsealed engine, you could technically machine your barrel. Also, if you're using an odd size gasket and you want to change your port timing, on a sealed engine, you wouldn't be allowed to. But again, you could machine your top or bottom of your barrel to get the optimal port timing on an unsealed engine. Those are tuning, engine, uh, tuning options you have on an unsealed engine, but they wouldn't be race legal on a sealed engine. I'm trying to run it to race specs, so I'm going to go for a squish of between 0.95 and 1.05. Normally about one mil on this, gas, on this engine. 
I already know this engine will always work with this gasket and pretty much come on spec anyway. But check each engine you do, change the gasket, get it right. If your squish is too loose, you're just losing power. Once we're happy with the squish, we need to install our, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, it's not really a valve cover, it's a top of your engine cover, engine cover. Basically it seals the water jacket in. There is a gasket around here, which is a big O-ring. Now this is an absolute pain to keep in place, so you might want to put a little bit of silicon around it just to help hold it in place. Or in this case, this one's been off recently, it's still very soft rubber, it's not gone hard and brittle, I might just leave it alone. Additionally in the top here, you want to install this ring to seal around the spark plug. And that will go on top here, like so. Next we install the reed block. Make sure your reed valve is not leaking. If you have a leaky reed valve, your two-stroke will not work. This is what stops the air going pushed back out here and makes it go through the transfer ports into the cylinder. So make sure your reed valve is good, all sealed, and as per spec, you've got that goes in first, this on top. And there's a gasket as well that goes in like so. And then there's five bolts that go in there. The top two go in, the bottom three you can leave out for now because your fuel pump and airbox bracket will sit on here and hang from these three bolts. So before you use your engine, you want to get a new spark plug. I haven't got one at the minute, but I'm going to put an old one in there now just to make sure the engine stays clean. And also, if we do it up, we can test our compression just by hand to make sure everything's turning properly. We're getting a good compression as we push around the, on the engine. It's not hissing out anywhere, there's no leaks anywhere that are obvious. Once the engine's hopefully got the start motor in it, you can do a proper compression test and see how good it is. But uh, it's just a good little check now to see everything's moving freely, everything seems to be feeling good. Good deal of compression. When the port opens, compression. Yep, feels good. Good. So next we install the power valve. We need to unwind it from here. Now there are some seals to change in here if you wish to in the gasket kit. There is a small little o-ring that goes on here which is just on there. Then there is also the two springs that hold the uh, the bellows to the housing, so you can change them if you need to, but this seems on, this all seems good. This will clean up. Make sure you get the excess gasket material off both faces. Next we install the spring and cover. So the spring goes on like that, the cover goes over that, and then there's two 8mm bolts that hold the power valve cover in place. So we just need to install them. And finally, in the back of the engine, you can install the exhaust manifold if it's not already on there, and the crank sensor, which has an O ring there, and it installs this way up, and two bolts to hold it in. And there we have a built engine. All we need to do now is install the starter motor in the starter ring and clutch.